governing documents um, I've already mentioned. Um, and governing documents have some, some nice terms in them. Uh, first and foremost of which, purpose, purpose or indeed trust. So what do we actually mean from a, from a charity or an organisational point of view? So to be a charity, an organisation must have purposes and, and they're defined pretty broadly as, as aims. This is what you're set up to do. But in terms of a charity, then they obviously need to be, you need to be set up to do something that which is exclusively charitable. Uh, a charitable trust, generally speaking, is a way for trustees, a group of people, to manage money, investments, land or buildings. And, and it sort of is defined by what they have to manage. Uh, charities generally are, are broader than, than just having land or assets to manage. You know, uh, they are about assisting people in certain ways, campaigning for this, campaigning for that. So they have broader activities than perhaps just a trust. But to be valid, charities uh, must be able to demonstrate both a clear charitable purpose and the delivery of benefit to the public or some section of the public. And then there's, some, you know, how do you define that? Uh, it's not basically um, simply for a group of private individuals that a charity is acting. It must be able to demonstrate that it's broader than the people who set it up. So there are, how many charitable purposes are there? There's roughly 13 headings of charitable purposes that have been agreed uh, and under that sit a number of, of sort of uh, descriptions of how you actually fulfill uh, a particular charitable purposes. So some of these I've got two up on the on the screen there. The advancement of amateur sport is a, is a charitable purpose. It, it's there. It's been defined in law. It's understood. You know, you can set up a charity to advance amateur sport, uh, and that means the advancement of any sport or games which promote health by involving physical or mental skill exertion. So these are the types of things that, when you're writing a charitable purpose. If you go on the Charity Commission's website, you will you will find a whole page of these 13 purposes and underneath that, it'll break down into the types of things they mean by the advancement of amateur sport. And, and again, going back to case law, these are things that have already been agreed. The 13th or the catch-all uh, of charitable purposes is, is the one that's on the screen there, which is any other charitable purposes, which it sounds wonderful. You can do everything, do anything and anything. So it, any charitable purpose that's not really been more clearly defined by the Charity Commission to date. Um, uh, so any new ones that come along, it's, it's that catch-all. Uh, and it could be anything from the provision of facilities for recreation and other leisure time occupation. Uh, in, this is how the wording of, of charitable purposes goes. It's in the interests of social welfare, the object of improving the conditions of life, et cetera, et cetera. So if you take a look at your governing document find out how under what you sit in terms of where your charitable purposes are if your charity was set up before the last charities act in 2011 it probably won't be written in the same way as you would do it now so a charity written 20 years ago would be would probably have simpler um, purposes or, or simpler objects we'll come on to objects but these are that the main headings there's 13 of these charitable purposes of which the advancement of amateur sport is one and any other charitable purposes of the catch-all under which all of the activities that you would likely to be do as a charity will be based will be will be sort of uh, categorized so i mentioned objects previously um a charity's objects are to a certain extent their purposes they are clearly linked with purposes but they are written in a certain way that should make clear a what outcomes your charity is being set up to achieve. It's to advance or it's to promote the advancement of the promotion of. You've got to be doing something that does something that has a, you know, an end result. You know? um, and then it has to explain in your objects how you will set about achieving those outcomes. It could be by providing advice, by raising awareness, by, by delivering meals on wheels, by, you know, uh, it could be it could be broken down into specific actions or it could be much more broader terminology. The object should also state who will benefit from the outcomes, from the delivery of the charitable purposes and how far those benefits extend to. So that could be a geographical area, that could be a, a certain section of the, of the community, etc. But you clearly have to define it and you have to put those into your governing document so that 
again, it regulates how you actually run the organization in the future. A charity's purposes and its objects should be the same. You know, there should be no tension between the purpose, the charitable purpose as understood by the Charity Commission and how you are actually going to set out to deliver um, that charitable purpose. And the object should express all of the charity's purposes. So you, you need to, you know, you can be in writing a governing document or in, in looking at your governing document, you could potentially see that there are more purposes being met than just one. OK. What do we mean by public benefit? So for an organization to be a charity, its purposes must fulfill the public benefit requirement. So it must be beneficial in a way that is easily identifiable, you know, and not just identifiable, but actually capable of being proved. And, you know, the more evidence you can actually get of that, the better, uh, you know, because it's not subjective. It's not down to a personal viewpoint. Um, you, with your uh, in your reporting to the Charity Commission are supposed to, through your annual report, supposed to state how you've actually fulfilled your charitable purposes and, you know, what evidence are you actually using to justify the statements that you put into your annual report? How are you actually con collecting evidence that you're actually delivering your charitable purposes to the people that you're setting out to, to deliver it to? Um, you have to bear in mind that any detriment or harm that results from the delivery of a charitable purpose, you know, to people, property or the environment, you know, it, it needs to be balanced. You know, and again, this is partly reputational as well. You must sort of weigh in the balance how the delivery of um, services to, to one section of the community does not actually impinge upon any other section of the community or the environment, etc. So purpose must benefit the public in general or a sufficient section of the public. I mean, what a sufficient section of the public is, you know, it varies from purpose to purpose. It varies from how you set yourself up and what goals and what objectives you set. But it does have to be identifiable and it has to be rational. So, you know, I can't, I'm a, sort of a, one of my, uh, in terms of one of my hobby horses, I, I, um, I've always wanted to actually set up a, a charity uh, for uh, the advancement of Napoleonic studies. Uh, but I guess it's only me and um, me mate Reg next door that might be interested in that one. So, you know, it has to be it has to be fought through. It has to actually involve quite a few people out there in the in the in the community. And it's not to give rise to more than incidental personal benefit. So this goes back to, you know, the the, uh, the requirement for trustees not to benefit financially from being a trustee. Uh, and we'll come on to this again in terms of conflict of interest in a moment. So personal benefit, you know, is incidental. Uh, so, you know, if you're a, a part of a, a charity that delivers a service um, and you as a charity um, trustee are actually receiving support from that service as well, well, that's fine as long as you're not receiving any other type of support that other members are not members, other members of the community are not receiving. So, you know, it has to be proportionate. You cannot benefit personally where uh, another member of the community would not. It's a it's a byproduct. Um, it's a, it's something that in the carrying out of the purpose. It's a, it's a, it's um yes it's um it's a benefit that uh, carrying out the service uh, does across the whole of the community etc. So um, I've mentioned powers previously and and given you examples where organisations have acted beyond their powers. Um, the Charities Act 2000 makes an assumption really now. So if you were setting up a constitution today, it's pretty much assumed that anything which is calculated to further its purpose, the purpose of an organisation, or is conducive or incidental to doing so, is allowed. It's pretty much telling you that you've got carte blanche to do anything that is in the interest of the charity. Governing documents uh, define the powers by which objects can be promoted. So uh, as I say, modern constitutions generally give their powers the widest possible sort of um, uh, leeway. You don't actually have to use the powers that are in your governing document, um, but if they're in there, you do have to obey them. You do have to abide by them. Uh, so they're discretionary in as much as you can choose not to use them, but they're not discretionary in that you can go beyond them and do things that your powers don't allow you to do. Uh, you can obviously, um, 
delegate your powers to subcommittees. You can bring other people on to um, the organization, onto a subcommittee of the organization. But you have to be careful in terms of what your government governing document says in terms of delegating those powers. So you, generally in terms of a subcommittee, I'm thinking of a live example, um, there is a there is a subcommittee of an organization in Paris that has a, a requirement for there to be three members of the board of directors on each subcommittee. Shame there's only one really, but never mind. Uh, you know, again, it's a bit of slippage in terms of the way they run their, their organization and, and they're making steps to address that now. So, you know, your governing document will also allow you to, to um, sort of understand what you can actually delegate or can't delegate to others who could potentially assist with the running of the charity. So, as I say, there's pretty much on new governing documents can't blanch but if you look at yours there'll probably be a list of powers that of things that you can do such as lending and borrowing employing staff insuring uh, we mentioned um, uh, uh, professional indemnity insurance etc or public liability insurance just being able to run the business um, acquiring and occupying property so taking out a lease buying the freehold trading um, i've mentioned um, some charitable constitutions have this bar on pro on trading full stop actually and, and one of the or certainly permanent trading activity uh, and one of the reasons for that is primarily to stop trading from skewing the actual objectivity of the charity because once you get involved in trading it, it can become all consuming you can actually put more effort into uh, generating income through your trading arm than you can actually running the service you were set up to do just as an aside, if anybody um, uh, is part of a charity that has um, a not so much a trading arm, but but does has a charity shop, it's worth bearing in mind that charity shops are not actually classed as trading by the Charity Commission or by charity law. And there's a there's a bit of a grey area there, in as much as if it's a question of charity receiving donated goods and then selling them on, that's not classed as trading. If the charity is actually, um, you know, anything like postcards, buying something in into their charity shop and then selling them on, that's trading. So you just have to be careful in terms of understanding what trading is in that respect. That's an aside. So um, setting up related companies and charities. So that's like, you know, getting over this issue in terms of trading by setting up a trading arm or finding out, setting up a new delivery arm to deliver an aspect of the charity, etc. You can alter constitutions, they're not set in stone. Um, there are processes uh, written into governing documents that say how you go about changing them. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that you can't change your objects or your purposes without consultation with the Charity Commission. Uh, you can change pretty much anything else by holding a, a, an AGM or even by written resolution these days, but you just need to be careful that if you're changing objects, you get prior permission from the Commission. Uh, and then obviously then uh, powers to wind up the charity, what happens to the charity's assets, etc. So these are things that generally sit in governing documents. Um, I right, trustee board, so trustees have over control of the charity. Um, we've mentioned that they might be known by other names, directors, board members, governors, committee members. But again, just re-emphasizing the point, whatever they're called, trustees are the people who lead the charity and decide how it is run. So trustees using their skills and experience collectively, that's collectiveness basically is where this whole notion of a board comes from. It's borrowed a term borrowed from business, obviously, uh, board of directors, etc. But it, what we're trying to get at here is that, you know, it's not individuals that run charities. It is a collective effort of people coming together, discussing the needs, uh, the issues, etc. of a charity and all members being involved in the decision making process. Very importantly as well, all members should have access to the same information upon which a decision is based. And to be quite frank, if the information isn't good enough, if you don't feel you can base make a decision on that information, then you should say so. And that should be part of the, the whole board process, is making sure that you've got sufficient information to actually make decisions on. Um, so what is the, the trustee board responsible for? Well, obviously it's making sure that the trust of the charity is carrying out the purposes for which it was set up. I, I'm banging on about the same old things here. You know, that, that governing document tells you what you're set up to do, how you're supposed to go about it, you know, and anything else that comes in, any other temptation, any other 
bit of cash that you wish to go and get, um, uh, which you know we all have a tendency in the third sector to chase funding, to 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 wish to to you know um, bend our objectives almost to try and fit into funding streams. Well, you just have to be very very careful how you go about this because it can skew your charitable purposes, your objectives, etc. Um, so from a, 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 a you know going back to the role and responsibilities of a trustee one of your responsibilities is to ensure that you understand the charity's purposes as set out in your governing document that you plan what your charity will do that you have a clear understanding of the direction of travel and what you wanted to achieve that you explain as well and this goes back to the confidence um, uh, issue that you explain to the public at large, how the charity's activities are intended to further or support its purposes. People need to know why you're there, what you're doing, how you're trying to do it. Otherwise, why are they going to actually give you any of their time, their donation, or whatever? You know, understand how the charity benefits the public by carrying out its purposes. We can all be a little bit blinkered in terms of you know what we mean by the benefit. You know, and, and unless you ask the beneficiaries to a certain extent how are you going to know that you're actually reaching them you're actually being of benefit to them bear in mind that spending charity funds on the wrong purposes is a serious matter so in some cases trustees may have to reimburse the charity personally that's your your um, your liability issue i haven't got any slides in in here regarding how you could potentially limit some of that liability which is you know a powerpoint for another day perhaps which is around obviously incorporation not being um not being uh okay let's very very quickly mention incorporation incorporation is where a charity takes on a legal entity of itself so if you're unincorporated all of the trustees say say let's talk about owning owning a building owning land um each trustee on an organization needs to be registered as the owner of that land with the land registry or you could have holding trustees admittedly but generally speaking similarly if you're taking out a lease on a building then the lease rests with the individual charity trustees not with the charity itself even though it's taken out for the purposes of the charity in law there is no legal entity in an unincorporated association that can take out that lease so a way of limiting your liability is to incorporate to create a legal entity and that is incorporation is simply setting up a company limited by guarantee or uh, you can now also set up a, a community in uh, no charitably incorporated organization a cio um, or of course there is the the community interest company vehicle so there are incorporated vehicles out there which do protect you to a certain extent in terms of making it easier to operate um, but I would stress that you know you still have to uh, you, you can't get away from the responsibilities that we've been outlining in, in, in the presentation to date you are responsible for your actions and for the actions of your fellow trustees